Hello and welcome to the Poetry Exchange. I'm Fiona Bennett. And I'm Michael Schaefer. Hi, Fee. Lovely to see you. Oh, it's great to see you, Michael. How are you? I'm very well. The, uh, the sun's starting to come out. Spring is... it's in the air. It's not quite here, but, you know, there are some promising signs. Yeah, and this is very helpful, isn't it? It's extremely helpful. Yeah, it really is. Good bird song of late. That sort of strange, dusky time of day when the birds start having a go. It's great. So, we're going to be doing something a bit different on this episode, aren't we, Michael? We are indeed, yeah. We're in this phase of work where we're doing a lot of work with the record-keeping. As I say that, I like to imagine that we have filing cabinets and sort of... Dusty shelves. Dusty yeah. shelves and wooden things and those kind of um, maroon-coloured folders. Unfortunately, most of it is in computers and clouds. But anyway, <laughs> I, like the, I like the more <laughs> tangible feel of it. Yeah, we're doing lots of work in the archive. So while we're doing that, it feels good, doesn't it, to, to lift up some of the treasures that we're rediscovering. That's right. Yeah, we're going to kind of be doing this. I think we're going to be revisiting a few old episodes. And this one is from nearly four years ago now. So we thought it would be a good idea to kind of reintroduce it, um, uh, kind of remind people that heard it first time around, uh, and also introduce some people that may have become listeners more recently. And uh, we were talking about uh, it feeling a bit spring-like, Fiona. This, that, that feels quite appropriate for, uh, for this poem. Indeed. We're going to be revisiting the episode that features a wonderful conversation with our visitor, Angela, about the force that through the green fuse drives the flower by Dylan Thomas. Um, so we'll be heading into that in a short while. I just wanted to discuss with you, Michael, that in listening back to the episode, there's many wonderful things that Angela says about the poem and her story with it. But what really struck me was the way she was able to articulate about the power of connection that she gets from Dylan Thomas's work. And that brought to mind this fantastic book by Kay Tempest called On Connection. Which is quite spooky, Fiona, because uh, I don't know when you bought that, but I, completely independently of you, bought that book a week ago. No. I was at the Barbican and uh, having a look around, I was like, ooh, that looks interesting. And so I've only just started it. I've got something else on the go, and it's kind of next on the stack. <sighs> this is just completely bizarre because I bought it not long after it came out. And I think I had it totally in mind that it would be a present for you, but I clearly <sighs> failed. So... <laughs> no, it was just other presents that got in the way. <laughs> I'm glad you managed to find it for yourself. Anyway, I don't want to do a spoiler for you, but this thing of connection, obviously, which is the title of Kay's book, and in particular, I wanted to share it because it really does speak to what we've been about with this project, really, of the reader being a vital part of the connection. So they say, imagine this triumvirate thing, the writer, the text and the reader. The reader is why it lives. All three things have to be burning for it to live. The moment of the reading is as important as the writing of it. And I just think, I mean, for those who've um, experienced Kay's work in performance, you'll know that the connection, the power of connection really is on another scale in their work. And I think what's fascinating about the book is the way they're talking about it in terms of the page. So that same sort of power, which all feels very appropriate to this title of the force that through the green fuse drives the flower, this sense of electricity, connective power. Um, it all feels very connected. So there's just another little bit that I was just going to read. Um, to really be useful to the connective power of the text, rather than interrogators, we must be the conductors. I think we're talking about electric conduction here. Yes. We, the readers or listeners, are crucial to the text, story or song being powerful. We are not impartial observers. We are a fundamental part of the circuitry. Oh, that's if, brilliant. Isn't that great? That's 
so fantastically expressed. It's funny, isn't it? I think sometimes the reader can be a bit forgotten. It can feel as if the reader is being regarded as as as, as quite a passive person in the in the deal. That's brilliant to to hear Co's words. They they express that absolutely spot on. Yeah, it reminds me a bit, Fee, of Peter Brook's thing about theatre where, you know, theatre is the thing that happens in the space in between the performer and the audience. You know, you can't have theatre without the audience. It doesn't Mm. exist. That's just a rehearsal. (laughs) Mm, And it's it's, it's the same kind of idea, I think, isn't it? Is that um, the, the audience or the reader is integral to the thing itself. It doesn't exist without it. I've got a sort of feeling in my solar plexus while you're saying these things you know and that is the experience isn't it I think that's what we've been wanting to sort of celebrate really with with the podcast is that sense of that level of event that takes place I will just say one more thing about this poem Fiona and and listening back you actually told me that Dylan Thomas was 17 when he wrote this which just blew my mind and that kind of life force is obviously what the poem is about but it just sort of comes through the poem in this extraordinary way and hits you doesn't it it really does yes I was just checking that as you were speaking Michael I think it was 19 I think he was 19 when he wrote it still absolutely astonishing well after all that discussion I think there's, there's quite a few other things coming, the other side of listening to this. Uh, we're going to have, have another poem, um, which Michael and I are going to read and uh, reflect on, which is sort of bouncing off from this one. And uh, there's a couple of other things to tell you about as well. So stay with us. But meanwhile, enjoy listening back to this wonderful conversation with Angela about Dylan Thomas's The Force That Through the Green Fuse Drives the Flower. It would be terrific to hear you read this poem, if that would be all right. Sure. Thank you. I'll probably go a bit Welsh when I... Even better. (laughs) The force that through the green fuse drives the flower, drives my green age, that blasts the roots of trees is my destroyer, and I am dumb to tell the crooked rose my youth is bent by the same wintry fever. The force that drives the water through the rocks drives my red blood, that dries the mouthing streams turns mine to wax, and I am dumb to mouth into my veins how at the mountain spring the same mouth sucks. The hand that whirls the water in the pool stirs the quicksand, that ropes the blowing wind hauls my shroud sail, And I am dumb to tell the hanging man how of my clay is made the hangman's lime. The lips of time leach to the fountain head, love drips and gathers, but the fallen blood shall calm her sores. And I am dumb to tell the weather's wind how time has ticked a heaven round the stars. And I am dumb to tell the lover's tomb how at my sheet goes the same crooked worm. Brilliantly read. Amazing. Shall I start with my confession? Yeah. Mm-hmm. She said, I think that's the first Dylan Thomas poem I've ever heard. <gasps> oh. Don't know any. Oh, please let it be the, not the last. <laughs> <laughs> After that, Angela, I don't think it will be. Oh, I don't think it will be. That was lovely then. That was lovely. How did it feel just then, just reading it then? It was it was good. It's been a long time since I've actually read that one aloud, so uh, it was good to, to actually feel it again because I don't re- I feel poems when I read them. Uh, if I'm reading poetry at home, I'll, I'll normally walk around actually reading it because it's very much about sound for me. Yeah. I mean, when I'm writing my own poetry, I have to actually speak it to make sure that it feels right I'm not I mean even though I I was for a long time what people would describe as a page poet in that I didn't do performance 
until fairly recently. Mm. Um, I've always needed to hear my poems. Mm. I, uh, it's no good just seeing them written down. Mm. Mm. And poets that I love tend to be poets that I love the sound of. And that's also true for Dylan Thomas, isn't oh, it? Oh, very much so. Himself, I think. Yeah, I mean, if you've heard his own mm. um, recordings, mm. uh, poems, it, it, you, you can tell he, he inhabits those poems. Mm. Obviously, it's a, a good Welsh voice is, is perfect for poetry anyway. I mean, mm. I've lost most of my accent, but uh, bits mm. of it creep in now and again. Mm. But uh, mm. it's, it's the, that, the whole music and poetry thing. Mm. Lovely. When did you first come across this one? Uh, when I was a teenager, probably about 14, 13, 14. At school? At school, oh yes. Uh, in uh, Wales? In Wales. Whereabouts in Wales? Uh, they're on the valley, they're the old mining territories. My, my granddad used to work in the mines. And uh, they're on there, it's a very, very green place. So, um, you're very much in in nature there, even though it's also the coal mines and the, the terraced houses. You go fr from your terraced house and you go up the hills and there are sheep wandering around. And so, yeah. <laughs> and you're right there. Yeah, mm. in right the, there. In the, in the countryside. Mm. And... Mm. and a lot of this poem spoke to that, that sort of whole adolescent thing, as well, that sort of, that, that beginning to, understand mortality and connection and also I just loved the way the words sounded and it, 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 I think Dylan Thomas really uh, was part of my first understanding of how words can really really affect you really hit you in the gut it's sort of visceral isn't it the oh, language somehow and it's absolutely the lips of time leech to the fountain head love drips and gathers yeah, it, it, that sort of totally... It is always really sort of rooted in the sound and the music mm. of it, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, Dylan Thomas does that a lot. Um, I, mean, the, the, I mean, the other Dylan Thomas poem, which really, really uh, affected me, um, was um, Do Not Go Gentle Into That Good Night, which yeah. I think more people will know than this one. Mm. Um, mm. And that, in fact, I mean, in a different way, it, it, it taught me a lot about... Uh, shape of poetry. Mm. Yeah, this is more about the, the guts of the poetry. Mm, lovely. Yeah. So, I mean, even it, do not go gentle's got the guts, but it's also got the shape. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if I always understand what's happening here. Uh, I don't always understand what's happening. Any really good poem, you don't all understand everything all at once, and sometimes you don't understand everything ever. But it you know it's there and there's something that connects with you, I think, yeah. 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 That's beautiful. I mean, the, that's the thing with Dylan Thomas, I mean, there, there are bits of Dylan Thomas poems where I think, well, I know what it means in a gut sense, but if you, if you ask me to sort of parse it, to uh, explain it, you know, word by word, why is, it, why is it this word, not that word? Because it needs to be that word, but don't ask me to tell you why. <laughs> It's like it's understood in a felt sense. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's it, understood in the body and not the head, yeah. you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you, if you actually look at it, uh, I mean, the structure mm. it is, is quite intellectual in, in, in a sense. You know, there's a balancing of this in nature with this in myself. I'm, I'm dumb to tell the crooked rose my youth is bent by the same wintry fever. That sort of, I can't tell my body, my, myself, about this thing, which is parallel with this thing in nature. And it's, it's, the pat, it's that pattern all the way through. Yes, I was going to ask yeah. about that, that repetition of, yeah. and I am dumb. dumb. Yeah. What's that about for you? It's about sort of uh, how that you know these things, but you, you can't necessarily communicate with the other, the other things to say, look, I'm like you. you. Nature can affect you, but you can't quite give that back. I, I'm, I'm inarticulate. Uh -huh. Ah, yeah. yeah, it's, 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 it's like the same energy mm. that's inside yeah. this wind or inside this rose or inside this water mm. is in me. Mm but I can't speak back to it mm. in the way that it can make me feel. It can make me feel mm. 
It can batter me, it's, 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 it's but I can't, yeah. with my words, yeah. come back at it, even and though that is what he's doing in the poem. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and it's also sort of, in a sense, you can't comfort, because he's talking mm. about, you know, um, I can't comfort the rose for being crooked by saying, look, I, it, that, that thing that's affecting you, that's, make, that's making you uh, age, be kept being crooked, is it, going to affect me too. A lot of it is about mortality, inarticulacy, and it's the sort of thing that really gets you when you're 15. <laughs> well, you say this, but I mean, I, I was very struck by that when you said it. You know, I, I met it when I was 17, and yeah. it mm -hmm. uh, and it was all about mortality and connection. And I'm, I'm not sure I was onto mortality and connection when I was 15, Michael. I, mean, I don't know about you, but certainly can, can, you, can you say any more about that? I mean... Well, yeah, I th I th maybe I was, I was just a strange child, possibly. No, no, I'm sure not. <laughs> I, mean, I, I was always a, yeah, a, a sort of a reading child uh -huh. a, and a, a dreaming child, if you like. I, I'd, I'd, I was one of these children who'd sit and watch... Uh, ants building a nest. I, I, I wasn't uh, a particularly typical child. I, re I, I read everything I could lay my hands on, which um, meant that by the time I was about what, nine or ten, I'd read everything in the children's library, so I was using my parents' tickets to read all the adult library books. <laughs> so, yeah, maybe, maybe that's why I, yeah. I wasn't uh, very yeah. typical in that sense. And but, I'm very interested in at that time and also now, how you connect to my green age. I well, mean, green, well green, green as in young, mm. yeah. Yeah, so, so it, it, it was the sort of, the life that's in the flowers is it, also the life that's in me, so it's it, uh, that connection with nature. And if you were feeling those kinds mm. of things as a dreaming <laughs> child or young person, mm. To, to then find in a book mm. that's in school? I came across it in school, that, mm. but then I got my parents to get me a copy of the collected poems of Dylan Thomas. Mm. My Christmas lists were always books, yeah. and <coughs> mostly poetry. <laughs> when I was reading Robert Graves and E. Cummings. Mm. I, was re I was really upset because my parents got me what they thought was the complete collected works of E. Cummings, but of course it came in two volumes, but it didn't say volume one and volume two, it said, you, the years or whatever. Oh, uh, yes. So, so oh. They, they got me one half of it, and it was the half with it which had the index in, so I could see which poems I didn't have. I, I mean, I, I eventually managed to get <laughs> get the, set, the the other volume. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. Yeah. So it, it, it is for me poetry. Yeah, it is very much a sort of like gut thing as well. I mean, I love people who are clever with words, but being clever with words isn't enough. Mm. Mm. And is this um, the, the, the connection with nature through mm. this poem you spoke about, mm. was that also you? Was it either reading or, or being in nature and being mm. outside? You were on the edge of, you know, in the yeah, pit Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I used to go sort of wandering up on the hills on my own. You took a sandwich with you, came back for tea. <laughs> and, you know, a, a, a child that, that read prodigiously, mm. and uh, here we are now in Manchester Central Library, and I'm meeting you for the first time, and you, you work here in the yeah, library? Yes, I, yeah, I work in the library. <laughs> are there opportunities for you now to be in this kind of connection with nature that was on your doorstep as a kid? Not as much by a long way, but I mean, I think I've, I've gone more towards the sort of the, the whole words thing rather than the nature thing. <laughs> yeah. I do performance poetry, um, just made me open mic, so I've done a few guest slots, but that um, has only been a fairly recent thing. Mm. So, yeah. That's, that requires some bravery. I would imagine. I don't, think I, I, I don't know. I, th I think uh, I, I become somebody different when I when I'm on ah. stage. When I started off, I'd quite often do a whole sort because of, I don't wear makeup normally. I do a whole sort of makeup and glitter and brilliant. Yeah. Wow. An alter ego. A whole An alter ego. Yeah. Yeah. Persona. yeah. So so th then when you're on stage, it's not you. It's yeah. the, the poet. But that makes sense that you would 
much you know this this interest in the in, in the poem aloud mm -hmm. and the speaking and the embodying and I was very struck when you spoke initially you weren't just talking about reading it aloud you were talking about walking and reading it mm. aloud oh yeah you know that is full engagement of the mm. full body and the mm. breath with the utterance mm. of the thing and actually it seems inevitable therefore that you would end up mm. needing to perform mm. almost in order to kind of mm. you know have mm. that connection of body mm. to emitting of poem yeah i mean quite often i'll act out to some extent my, my poems as well i want to ask you about in fact what i'd like to ask you could you read the third stanza again and then just tell me something about what comes up for you as you read that the hand that whirls the water in the pool stirs the quicksand that ropes the blowing wind hauls my shroud sail and i am dumb to tell the hanging man how of my clay is made the hangman's lime yeah, that that one's not an easy stanza to. Mm. That's one that I wouldn't be able to parse no, no, in that no. sense. But I um, mean, the, the sense again, especially the, the last part. I'm dumb to tell the hanging man how of my clay is made the hangman's lime. I'm part of that destruction as well as experiencing the destruction. I love that pattern. I mean, the pattern is very mm. tight, isn't mm. it? In it because mm -hmm. it, you know the structure of yeah. every single stanza mm. is exactly. Mm -hmm as it is, the force, the force, mm -hmm. the hand, the lips, mm -hmm. that does this. Mm -hmm. I mean, even to the length of the line, mm -hmm. is my destroyer, turns mine to yeah. wax, hauls my shroud. Oh yeah, the rhythm, rhythm is the same through each yeah. stanza, until you get to the end and you've got that, that shortened bit that's a final, uh, and I'm, this is the thing that I'm really dumb to tell. It, it kind of feels like this is the, the hardest thing, in a sense, to say that you can't say. Mm. Just read that for us, Angela. And I am dumb to tell the lover's tomb how at my sheet goes the same crooked worm. Give me a sense of what that, what, what you get from that. I actually, the, the lover's tomb, I, I always get an image of Romeo and Juliet in there. Um, I don't know whether, whether Dylan meant it to be there, but that's where it is for me. And it's the whole like, concept of the, tra the tragic lover and death is coming, the, the crooked worm, which is the me medieval concept of the maggot, the sheet, the winding sheet. Uh, so, yes, yeah. yes, I too will die, be gnawed by <laughs> yeah. the worms. Yeah, exactly. yeah, so, but I can't tell the lovers yeah. this. And for them, their tragedy feel, is like unique to them. Mm. That's very good, isn't it? <laughs> That's very good. Yeah, I love the alliteration there. I do, do like the use of alliteration in poetry. It's a, I am dumb to tell the weather's wind how time has ticked to heaven round the stars. And you think, if he only hadn't drunk himself to death, but then you think, if he hadn't been the sort of man who was going to drink himself to death, would he have written the same poems? And probably not. <laughs> no, I'm not sure that the force mm. that threw the green fuse was driving him would have been the same. Mm. I'm interested to know how this has changed for you over the years. I mean, I think in some ways it's, it's a fixed point in my past, but in some ways, I mean, mm. I, as, as an older person, I can actually look back on my younger self and think, well, yes, actually, you were a bit of a melodramatic little so-and-so, and, -so, <laughs> and that's why you liked, <laughs> liked it so much. <laughs> We often ask people, uh, if this poem were a, a friend to you, what kind of a friend do you think it would be? Uh, this poem probably would be the sort of friend that I, I'd go, go, go out for a drink with and get sort of melancholy drunk with, and have a good weep, and then go, yeah, right, OK, let's go off and do something else. Brilliant. <laughs> yeah. Brilliant. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> Great. Is it that sort of melancholy for a, a, a time past, in a way, or is it, does the melancholy come from, from what's actually in the poem or just the way it makes you feel when you read it? I think it's sort of more, more than that, that sort of slight me melodrama, because I mean, there is a slight melodrama to it, mm. <laughs> and it's, it's a sort of melodrama that I enjoyed, <laughs> so it's like, yeah. Let's go it's, there. Yeah, it's a bit like, there. let's go, go there, yeah, isn't it, yeah. though? Let's yeah. sit and drink and talk yeah. about 
this yeah. stuff, you know, oh, let's and, 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 let's, and, 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 and let, let, yeah. let's read that, re, read that old love letter from from, from the, the ex that I really w wish I hadn't broken up with, and <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so all that stuff that we know isn't terribly safe for our yeah. mental health or good for us or healthy yeah. or yeah. positive. Excellent. Let's just do all that dark stuff mm. on a with a bottle of bourbon and mm. you know whatever. That's great. The force that through the green fuse drives the flower. The force that through the green fuse drives the flower drives my green age, that blasts the roots of trees is my destroyer. And I am dumb to tell the crooked rose my youth is bent by the same wintry fever. The force that drives the water through the rocks drives my red blood that dries the mouthing streams, turns mine to wax, and I am dumb to mouth unto my veins how at the mountain spring the same mouth sucks. The hand that whirls the water in the pool stirs the quicksand that ropes the blowing wind, hauls my shroud sail, and I am dumb to tell the hanging man how of my clay is made the hangman's lime. The lips of time leech to the fountain head. Love drips and gathers, but the fallen blood shall calm her sores. And I am dumb to tell a weather's wind how time has ticked a heaven round the stars. And I am dumb to tell the lover's tomb how at my sheet goes the same crooked worm. That was Fiona with the very beautiful gift reading at the end there. So in case you're not aware, um, always in exchange for somebody uh, giving us their time and sharing their poem with us, we create a gift reading for them. It's, um, we try to do it wherever possible, sort of straight off of the back of the conversation and try to capture some of the feeling that was present in the conversation. Yeah, I really enjoyed hearing that back, Faye. Yeah, amazing. It was in the Manchester Central Library, wasn't it, that conversation? It was, I remember. yeah. And actually, I think we were just very lucky that we sort of bumped into Angela and sort of signed her up. <laughs> That's exactly right. We had a last-minute cancellation ah, that left us with a, with, a, with a spot. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, Angela was, you know, working at the Manchester Central Library and um, she was like, yeah. I've got a poem that's been a friend to me. <laughs> I loved that there was no, um, you know, there was no preparation. This wasn't something that was kind of thought about. It was, um, and her connection to it was so specific, I suppose. Being from the Rhonda Valley, um, uh, the, the, the musicality of the language just felt so right in her voice, even though, as she says, you know, she sort of lost a lot of her accent. And just because she encountered it at such a young age, at such a green age, uh, as Dylan Thomas would have it. And, um, yeah, so it's fantastic. I was just noticing now, sort of revisiting the poem, Fiona, how it, it does have a kind of a movement. Some of the, you know, the images at the, at the beginning of the poem are all, you know, the, my green age and that... that, that powerful life force that young driving spring time life force and at the end the images are uh, you know the lover's tomb the fallen blood how do you do that mm. i mean the aware not only the awareness of being that young and vibrant but an awareness that that doesn't last uh, that's gobsmacking i'm gonna say michael i just emailed over to you this other poem that I thought you might read for us actually that came to mind when I was thinking to share it'd be great to share another poem on this episode and not Dylan Thomas but another Thomas and another Welshman Edward Thomas born of Welsh parents but born in London and lived his life in England and wrote a lot about the green as well 
uh, in a very different kind of voice to Dylan Thomas. Uh, it's a very different rhythm and perspective, but a poet deeply connected to nature and to beauty. And I think some of that tandem that is in the poem that Angela brought to us about the sort of roaring power of life and water and endurance and renewal and spring that we were just talking about, all of that alongside death and destruction and the possibility of all those things ending, which is particularly poignant in the case of Edward Thomas, who, of course, was killed on the battlefields of the First World War, age 39. And we've had a few Edward Thomas poems that have come in, and this is one that has. And uh, for various reasons, we've not been able to create a podcast as yet from them. So I wondered if you could read for us. This is Tall Nettles. Tall nettles cover up, as they have done these many springs, the rusty harrow, the plough long worn out, and the roller made of stone. Only the elm butt tops the nettles now. This corner of the farmyard I like most, as well as any bloom upon a flower. I like the dust on the nettles, never lost, except to prove the sweetness of a shower. Wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much. Great, I really like the the images in that. You can, it's one of those you can really see, isn't it? You know. It's just fantastic, isn't it? And uh, it's like a single frame, isn't it? It's a single frame around a, a particular patch of ground and he mm. just goes in there and gives it gives it so much. And it's a, I, I, I love his, his a slightly reflective voice always, uh, Edward Thomas. Well, that was all lovely to revisit, Faye. Oh, it's excellent, isn't it? We could do this all day. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Easily. Now, I did also want to say it's been fantastic. We had so many people respond to the survey. Oh, great. I think on the last episode we mentioned that we had a survey out yeah. there. Um, and just a huge thank you to everybody who, who filled that in. I, I know I often get sent those things and think, Good Lord, no, I've not got time for that. But a lot of people have given us their time to do that and and said really specific, useful things in those boxes where we were able to sort of ask people to offer a few thoughts. And actually that all of that work is going into some funding applications that we're doing at the moment and also very directly into our thinking about what we're doing and how we're doing it. So really helpful. Thank you so much. That's brilliant, Fee. And just to say, if anyone listening um, hasn't signed up to the newsletter, that's a really great thing to do. Uh, go to the website, thepoetryexchange.co.uk, and you'll find where you can sign up to that. We do not bombard you. Uh, and, of course, we don't share your details with anyone else. Uh, but it's a good way of keeping up to date with the various things that we get up to. We'll be back with you next month with more Poems as Friends. Until then, thank you for listening. Thank you for listening.